Gene is actually an AWS serverless hero. So for those who don't know, it means he performed some great achievement for the AWS community. And he was awarded by AWS this title of honor. So his next talk will be about how to make serverless green, or like how green is serverless, and what are the best practices to make sure you're um, doing good in terms of reducing consumption of energy. So please give a great round of applause for Sheen talking about green. Right, good morning. Got my time set 25 minutes, so I need to run fast. Um, yeah, so I'm part of the Lego group, and uh, this is not a super technical talk. This is more of creating awareness, best patterns, and practices when it comes to sustainability. Right? Let's go. So, <clears throat> when, when I say sustainability, what comes to your mind? Go for it. What does it mean to you, sustainability? Green. Green, right? Yeah, so green energy or environment, or uh, low carbon emission, all these things that uh, we talk about. But in fact, if you look at the, the definition of sustainability or sustaining, it's more generic. It's not just environment or low carbon or, uh, you know, the green energy. It's beyond that. It's basically a process of keeping things going with the necessary nourishments. So that means when, it, when we talk about uh, environment or green energy, what we are saying is like this planet, we want to keep it going in the good shape and form for our future generations. So that's where the sustainability comes in. And so that means sustainability as a principle can be, appli can be applied to many things. We talk about, you know, financial sustainability or uh, sustainable cities. Take, for example, Serverless Days Conference. So the days when Ant and others started as Jeffcon a few years ago, if you are able to run this conference now, that means they are able to sustain this conference going forward. So all these things can be sustained, you know, part of the sustainability, um, uh, the, the definition of the thing that we talk about. So if you, if you Google, if you, if you go to Wikipedia and look at uh, sustainability, you will see these sort of three pillars of sustainability. Social, economic, and of course, environment. And they have an interconnection because the social welfare, you know, impacts environment. Uh, the economic growth impacts environment. Economic growth of a developing nation has a different problem with the environment than the economic growth of a developed nation. So they all have different, uh, you know, needs and requirements. So that's why when they put together, so they kind of impact each other to the, you know, on the environment. So moving on to uh, cloud, for example. <clears throat> so if you think of cloud, if you, if, you, if you eliminate the sort of, uh, you know, the buildings and everything else around, it's basically three main things in compute, right? So it's the network, storage, and compute. So those three mainly form the cloud infrastructure that we, uh, that we have, whether it's a serverless or, you know, servers. And uh, say, for example, you, your, your front jam sitting next to you in the office or just opposite, let's say, you know, safe three, uh, two meters, safe distance. Back in the days, my old days, if Jan wanted to share a video file or a, you know, music file or something, she would hand over me a floppy disk. I don't know how many of you heard floppy disk or used. Or the next generation, it could be a CD or a DVD, and then came the ESP set of things. But these days, we don't do that, right? Because all our files are somewhere up in the cloud, okay? So that means they need to go somewhere to find her file and create a link and then email the link or message the link to you. And you, what do you do? You click the link, it goes somewhere, fetches the file, downloads, all these things happen. So the two meter distance, depending on where you are located, it could be 200, 2,000, 20,000 or more round trip and things happen behind the scene. The point is, at every point, the data gets transferred and moved across, there is energy consumption happening 
because you need to have compute somewhere, right? Even when you download, there is a program gets invoked to do all these things. So that means there is, behind the scenes, we are burning energy. That means that has an impact on the energy consumption, environment, all those kind of things. Let's shift our focus on to serverless. So why does it matter to serverless? So there are three, three things I want to talk about. One is um, serverless products we develop and the processes we use as part of our serverless development. And then, of course, the cloud, that's where we kind of host or deploy and run our services. So I call this as a sustainability triangle. So we have the product, process, and the cloud, and we have the, you know, the whole sustainability uh, binding them together. So what do I mean by sustainability, uh, sustainable serverless product? Remember I mentioned that the sustainability is applicable to many things. So this is exactly what I mean. Sustaining a serverless application, the product that we develop, is it sustainable? I'll go through in detail soon. And the processes, the help to develop the sustainable serverless applications and then operate them on the cloud with all the sustainability uh, consciousness in place. And of course the cloud, the best practices. And uh, when it com comes to cloud, serverless, there are two parts. So you have certain things set up by the cloud provider, and then we make use of those services to operate our things. So there are two elements. So in AWS terms, they call it sustainability of the cloud and in the cloud. So sustainable products, so I always say that, when it comes to serverless development, you have to change your mind and think a new way of building and running products. We need to come out of the legacy or the old ways of doing things. What do I mean? So typically, is anyone working with uh, the typical waterfall model here? So this is what you get in the typical olden days. So three months or six months, whatever be the, you know, the time frame, the teams, different teams will do these things and finally you get to a release stage and they go into maintenance mode. Whereas these days, we don't do that. We do, we come with an idea, we iterate, bring up something, deploy, operate, and then we sustain it. That means we keep it going. Take, take any uh, you know, uh, cloud product, for example. If you are an AWS, take DynamoDB or even Bridge. When they get released, they get a minimum you know, uh, features and things. Then they sustain, add more features, and keep it going. It's not just kind of once they release, it's not going to maintenance mode at all. So the two things, olden days, Big Bang releases. Nowadays, we are more iterative. And uh, those days, you do something, you release, go to maintenance as it's dead. You know, typically back in those days, if there was a visitor to your office, and uh, you, you know, if you took, took the person along, you say, oh, this is Bob, he's the you know, enterprise architect, awesome guy. This is Jen, she's a lead engineer. Her team is you know, doing bleeding edge technologies. You know, they sit over here, they're always on the thing. And then we'll say, dark corner, oh, those bunch of guys, maintenance guys. You know, that's sort of the typical you know, setup we used to have. And talked about uh, these sort of silos earlier. So, with serverless, we are kind of live and kicking all the time. The silo, especially, is all gone. We've broken down the barriers. Now we are full stack and diverse. But when it comes to serverless, okay, um, you need to have the mind shift I mentioned to think differently. Think making use of managed services as much as possible. Think decoupling, asynchronous, event-driven architecture. These sort of things are core fundamentals to a serverless way of doing things. Okay, so what is a non-sustainable serverless product? How do you identify a product? Simple. Invite four people from outside, ask them to look at your uh, uh, product that uh, you are going to kind of add a new feature or something. If you hear any of this, you know, coming out of them, then you know that you have a problem. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you ever hear the fourth person's word, then you know it's definitely a problem. This application, nobody can do anything. It's not sustainable. 
Okay, so that means, what is a sustainable application? There are three main things when it comes to serverless. First thing is modularity, okay? So the application has to have its own boundaries, context, contracts, independent, small microservices. Second thing is extensibility. These two go together, modularity and extensibility, because unless your application can be extended, you can't do anything. In order to be extensible, it needs to be modular as well. So here is where you think of asynchronous nature, event-driven computing. These sort of the best practices and patterns come into place. And the final one, often we people forget, observability, very important. And it has a bunch of characteristics that you need to put in place as part of your application. Distributed tracing, it's ever so important, event-driven computing. And uh, the metrics, structured logging, all these things are super important. Okay, so sustainable processes. So as I mentioned, processes that help you build sustainable products and also operate them on the cloud in a sustainable way. So these are the methods and tools. There are three, three things. So on one side you have people, that's us, then the processes, the, you know, the sort of methods and practices that we follow, and of course the cloud. Equally, you can equate that, so that's the mindset and the methods that we do, and also the machines, that's the, you know, the cloud that we have. So few of the, you know, pro, uh, best practices and patterns that we can uh, look into. Reduce waste. How many times when someone raises a PR before it gets to its, uh, you know, deploy state, it hangs around somewhere? Because if it's kind of, you know, staying too long, it's consuming more resources. And maybe you already provision certain, you know, tables or queues and this and that. They're just hanging around there with no use. That means they obviously are consuming something at your provider's end, right? We don't kind of get to see, but it happens. And then, material and practical iterate you. So I already mentioned that evolving products in iterations so that really help because you are reducing waste. You are just focusing on what you need to get you through, get through, not you know something bigger and that you'll not you will never use. And the other thing is automation. Automation, I think these days is a given. Everyone talks about automation. It's not just CI/CD pipeline automation, test automation, and so many developer experience. Um, refactoring is an important aspect of serverless. I think, and briefly touched on this earlier, because the serverless ecosystem is evolving day by day. That means new services, new features, new patterns and practices are coming out every day. So that means we shouldn't hesitate to modify or refactor our applications to make them efficient or better. So that should be part of, you know, the serverless development. And then, back in the days, we used to have this sort of throwaway prototype. You do some prototype and throw away. I mean, these days, you don't need to because whether, whether it's your dev, QA, or prod environment, as far as cloud is concerned, it's just the same. Right? It's just our way of differentiating. Simply because you have a dev account doesn't mean that they kind of downgraded everything all of a sudden. No, it's just still the same. So that means with a bit of a thinking and planning, you can start with your prototype, take it to an MVP, so that means you don't waste anything. And finally, reusing and think of the longevity, that is the sustainable product, and then growing serverless teams. In order to be sustainable, you have to have a sustainable engineering team in place. I do a completely a separate talk on how to grow serverless engineers, so that is an essential part of a serverless culture in an organization. Let's move on to cloud, so that's where our focus should be. So, when it comes to cloud, it's a partnership between us and the provider. You hear this sort of vendor lock-in, that lock-in, this lock-in, that's fine. But if you chose a provider, whether it's AWS, Azure, GCP, or whoever, it's a partner you work with. Both parties should work in tandem to get the best out of it, okay? So that means it's the responsibility is shared. If you are familiar with AWS, you know the shared security responsibility. Similar to that, when it comes to sustainability, there is a shared responsibility. So 
how is it shared? So if you take a cloud provider, they provide the compute storage, they do the resource sharing, they, they, they kind of put their measures in place to bring you know, renewable energy and low carbon emission, all sorts of things. That's fine. But our responsibility as a customer consuming the service is how we make use of those uh, resources. We may say that, oh, we use managed service. We use the DynamoDB as a managed service. Yes, fine. Because cloud provider, they take care of sharing resources and all sorts of things. But if we don't use it properly, then we are not contributing to the sustainability movement. Say, for example, I heard from one speaker uh, once, we can buy the best energy efficient washing machine, AAA rated or whatever. Then, if we use it to wash one cloth at a time, we are not helping it at all, right? We are completely destroying the basic reason why we bought that energy efficient. So think that way. And uh, so, yeah, so AWS have this, you know, shared responsibility model. So let's focus on some of the best practices when it comes to operating in the cloud. So that's our responsibility. There are five things. So user behavior, software architecture, data and storage, compute infrastructure, and the development deployment. I'll go through quickly to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So when it comes to user behavior, that means you are looking at working with the customers and you know, providing them the best ever solution. The first pattern or principle I would say is serverless first. Because if you go serverless first, you are already one step there when it comes to the sustainability uh, you know, thinking or the, uh, the practices. Now, there are a few things. So typically, when you have high event or high traffic uh, event, you plan for the occasion, you provision resources and things like that. So plan them so that instead of blindly, you know, setting up or your scaling parameters, understand what's the need and just focus on for that particular one. So that means you're not kind of over provisioning, not over burning resources, over consuming energy, all sorts of things. And um, the same thing I mentioned, especially with uh, work with the cloud provider. So they support you planning for the event and keep hold on to your past metrics and the, you know, the details that will help you plan the next event. So that's an important aspect when it comes to user behavior pattern. And the other thing is, take your services close to customers. It's easier said than done because there are so many things, you know, legal registration, you can't take data from one region or one continent to other. So there are limits. And also when it comes to uh, the green region, that again is not there fully, AWS offers and a cloud providers offer, but that probably not the ideal one to, to, to use. So there's, there's some work to do, but think of these kind of, you know, the patterns when you think of, you know, customers. And the data storage is a very important one. The simple thing is, in your day-to-day -day work, development work, if you don't need the data, don't store it. Simple as that. The other important thing is, these days, data is everything, right? So they say data gold. But thing is, not all data stays gold forever. They become dust at some point. Once you extracted the essence out of the data, they are useless. Know when that transition happened and get rid of it. So that means you are not building a dust mountain that will become an issue later on, okay? So this is a very important aspect when it comes to data storage and patterns. So there are a few things. The way we, um, I select the data store, the right one for the job, and then uh, the policies to transition data from, say, hot storage to gold storage, make use of them, because they then, you know, aid energy consumption and various other aspects, so that means you can kind of, you know, move towards that. And the other thing is data movement. This is a, you know, big thing because uh, it's, it's hard, to, hard to control with all the replications and global tables and so many other things. But think about it. Don't go flat with uh, the policy. Say every, you know, table needs to be replicated from this region to other region. Identify the data that needs to be replicated in case of emergency or recovery and take it that way. And the data lifecycle. So I kind of classify four, four things here. 
So often you work with the cache data, that's a temporary that goes away for after a few minutes or hours. Then you have something like uh, temporary short-term data. This is like, uh, say for example, if you, have, if you follow the storage first pattern, most of the data come under this category, short term. So they, they're there, once you process, then they're gone. So you extracted the good bits, they become your long term active data. So you need to keep them for business reasons, legal reasons, they can stay for months or years. Identifying them is, is important. Then the archival bot, that is the you know, data that goes, for, goes into the archives for long story. The data removal, make use of the options available. Uh, simple time to leave, or time to leave with a transition, or even a scheduled cleanup. There are a number of ways to do. I mean, if you work with the cloud, cloud databases, they offer you know, many options. So making use of them is uh, crucial. Software architecture pattern. So I already talked about uh, decoupled and event-driven architecture. That is the fundamental when it comes to uh, building serverless applications. And a uh, few other things. So microservices, event-driven microservices. Who doesn't build microservices these days? But think, think that way. Think smaller microservice. Don't go with the textbook style, oh, because customer is a microservice, you don't need to build customer as a whole as a microservice. Break it, the, break it down, that domain, and bring smaller or build smaller microservices. Queues, use them appropriately. And if you have a background job, if, even if you have a spike, you don't need to kind of, you know, scale up immediately. Push them into the queues to soften the thing. So that means your provider does need to kind of, you know, provision extra things. They may be able to manage with the services already they are running to, 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 to support this workload. So that's why you can use the mechanisms available to smoothen those. And uh, granularity is a core thing in serverless. You can drill down deeper levels to tune things. Your Lambda function, two functions can be tuned completely differently to their needs. Queues and data tables and so many things. Similar to security, the least privilege principle. Go deeper, never kind of set to one level for everything. So that's an important uh, aspect. Deletion, yes, unused services, get rid of them. So many times it happens. You come up with one service, then you know, version two comes along, or you use a strangler pattern to move everything towards this side. What happens is everyone else moved here, but you're still holding on to this one. Get rid of those things, because they kind of you know, uh, waste resources and stuff. And obviously the batch job is, is kind of difficult, but uh, probably you can work with your provider to know when is the good, good time to kick off certain you know, heavy batch background jobs um, um, uh, during the day. Right, so compute infrastructure, it's, uh, there's a new, 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 new thing now. Because typically when we tune our applications, we tune for cost and performance. Nowadays, sustainability tuning is a thing. Because what we usually do when we tune for performance, we go all the way up to the top, right? Your SLA may say here, this level, but we already kind of you know, gone above. Sustainability thinking, what it says is that if your SLA says here, you know, tune up to that level, be conservative. So that is the kind of the, you know, the difference. Um, so I think already I, I talked about these things, optimization, uh, just the required uh, level of uh, tuning and uh, provisioning, granularity I talked about, that's an important aspect of serverless, and the compute, obviously I just mentioned uh, Lambda, anything any new services or processes that can be you know, efficient in terms of um, you know, the consu consuming energy and process power and et cetera, use them. And uh, services and scaling. Scaling is uh, you know, scaling to zero using the sort of horizontal scaling and uh, scale to zero. There is a debate going on in the AWS world. Anyone using uh, Aurora serverless? Anyone? Okay. So is Aurora serverless version two serverless or not? Because it doesn't scale to zero. So there is a debate on whether Aurora serverless version two is serverless or not. Anyway, uh, so deployment and uh, thing automation. Automate everything. Um, I'm going to go fast because otherwise I will get a bell. 
Um, yeah, I mean, things I already talked about, uh, development side, and automation is, as I mentioned, is not just a pipeline, it's so many other things that you can automate as part of your uh, serverless development. Okay, so moving on to the last part, is uh, uh, enterprise sustainability. So what do we do at uh, Lego Group, and also how can we kind of bring this sustainability thinking into your teams? So as you can imagine, Lego Group, big organization, socially responsible, they operate with, uh, you know, uh, four things, play, people, partner, and uh, planet. So the planet aspect is a big thing on sustainability. So they have a whole, you know, department, division, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm not going to go through the details there. So they are kind of gradually moving on to the journey because it's not easy, easy in certain cases because sometimes you need to educate the customers or consumers before you can make any changes. So that is always a challenge for business. You can't simply, oh, you know, I'm going to go, I don't know, bag free or paper, you know, plastic free now because your customers still express certain things in a certain way. So there's always a challenge. So let's say, what do we do? In, uh, what, do we, what did we do in digital technology division to create the awareness? So one thing we did was we ran a sustainability awareness week. So it was spread on to four days, a bunch of topics. We invited a number of speakers uh, from, from around the industry, different cloud providers, different software organizations, and we focused on uh, these things, what is sustainability to kick off with. Then we looked into cloud and technology, some of the things I already talked about. And then the social elements of sustainability, and then was a wrap up. So, so a bunch of ideas came and all captured in mirror boards and things like that. And uh, four crucial things came out of the awareness week. One is identifying the blockers. So what are the elements that kind of prevent us from, you know, uh, moving towards this sustainability principle or, you know, practicing those uh, uh, patterns, for example. And then what support can we, you know, provide? And thinking of the opportunities, where can we find, you know, identifying teams that will be able to kind of, you know, uh, get ahead of the curve and they can then help others. And um, finally, the community, internal community, is something you can, everyone can practice, internally development teams across the, you know, the digital or your engineering uh, teams. You can, you can bring this sort of uh, community with few members and then create the awareness. And uh, across the different teams. So one of the things I, I often talk to my teams is like uh, AWS has uh, this called a carbon fr footprint monitor. It's nowhere, the, nowhere near to its uh, perfectness, but I always encourage them to get some idea, go there, even if it may not record so many things because it's focused currently on you know, containers and things like that, but still allows them to get the idea or at least at, in that kind of you know, mindset. And so this is where cloud providers need to do plenty of things. Because if you look at, uh, say, one service, S3 or uh, Dynamo, they, get, uh, they give you a pricing details page where they give you a number of different scenarios and they will give you exactly how much it will cost. We need to get the sustainability or the carbon footprint monitoring to that, that level. For example, if you are storing 5GB file in a, a data store and operating and, uh, you know, doing a bunch of analytics, what is the footprint? So we need to get to that level. So that's where the cloud provider's responsibility uh, is uh, very crucial. And other thing is, uh, I, I kind of often uh, mention to engineers, incorporate as part of the solution design. Even if there isn't anything to specifically state, add a section to say that, okay, I did consider sustainability as part of my you know, architecture or the design I propose. Um, so similar to sorry, security or threat modeling, for example. And uh, I, I'm writing a bunch of blog posts on sustainability still ongoing. So you, you, know, you, can, you can follow those uh, blogs to get more idea of what I just mentioned. And uh, few resources, so cloud providers, they have a uh, ton of things. All cloud providers now have sustainability as a main uh, section as part of their uh, offering. And Green Software Foundation, that's another one they have plenty of you know, useful material and stuff. Then of course the United Nations has its own kind of you know, uh, broader uh, sustainability uh, details. So to close, so developing serverless applications, sustainable applications using sustainability principle is basically a journey. Okay, it's, there's no, it's not an end point. But the practices and the patterns that we uh, use or follow, they will help us to get on with our journey, 
having a bit, you know, such a sustainable environment, at least our contribution as serverless engineers to it. So that's all today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheen. We'll take a few questions now. We have at the front. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I saw you guys did some uh, like workshops, sort of looking at maybe where your blockers were, et cetera, that kind of thing. I'm just curious, um, so I, I assume that you implemented some solutions. Uh, where, where do you think your biggest gains came from as far as sort of trying to make your uh, general processes more sustainable? Process in the sense? Uh, in, the, in the sense of like your, your architecture, your service ar architecture and uh, what you have in place. Like just, what, uh, I don't know, I, I assume that you got like some information out of that based off of, you know, your, your current actions and sort of where you guys moved forward. And I was just curious, like, you know, what, what like, was there like just something that was maybe... Uh, like a change that had uh, a lot of impact or, or in, in specific or, you know, like what kind of from your experience? So across the organization, general sustainability, there are so many things happening. So if I take, if, if, if I focus on the serverless parts of, you know, the teams where I focus serverless technologies, the change happens, but slowly. So one of the things that uh, myself and others uh, look at when we do the design review is kind of trigger that thinking. So for example, if we notice uh, TTL was in place in a data modeling you know, division, then that becomes a question. Similar to if you go back early days, when, we, when, when everyone started writing Lambda functions, they put for security the asterisk, right? Permission to everything everywhere. So then that, you know, the awareness kicked in as part of PR reviews. Then people ask, okay, do you need this Lambda read and write to this thing. They say, no, you're just reading it. So make it just read, you know, uh, policy. So that way, the process comes in slowly but surely. It's not uh, one thing that we put out, say that, oh, you know, you need to follow these things. That may not suit everyone or, you know, every service they built. Yeah. So that's sort of the movement that happens. And okay. it, it's just starting. Yeah, so I guess like the biggest thing you got was maybe uh, common questions that you could ask per functionality developed. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Next question. Thank you so much for the conference. Um, I have one question. Uh, how, how much uh, it impacted the efficiency of the team when they started to think about this kind of, of sustainability uh, concerns? So Does it change the, the, the velocity of production, something like that? It, it shouldn't or it won't, at least in our case, because we already operate in a smaller squad mode, like, uh, you know, the Spotify model. So that means a particular product squad is like uh, eight or nine people. So that way it's easy to communicate and easy to put something in practice rather than the wider scene. So that's why I mentioned that, uh, you know, identifying this sort of uh, pilot teams to, you know, put these ideas first in place and then spread it around, that, that, that helps. So I don't think the efficiency has, you know, any impact or anything because anyway is part of their designing and building solutions. Say, for example, I, I, I talked about modularity and extendability, that is part of the way they architect. If I see something that can be split into different services, I will raise the question. I'll basically make them realize why I'm asking the question first. And then they realize, okay, so this particular service has nothing to do with the API because that is fronting the customer. It can sit, in the, sit at the back and do things in a different way. So that sort of thinking uh, that we need to kind of put in place. So it doesn't affect the efficiency now as of, you know, as the way we operate. 